you can think of a neural network as a program that has sort of been created by just running lots and lots of data through the system. And now you're faced with the task of, well, what does this program do and how does it do it? What do the different parts do? It's a lot like reverse engineering a complex computer program. The network parameters in this case are the binary code and the neural net architecture is the virtual machine which is executing the program. So essentially you're running on a classical computer, but then you have this neural network architecture that's coded up to execute all the parameters. When you run data through it, those parameters fire and do things to the data and give you an output. Um, and as those parameters are firing, they're essentially executing complex binary code to give you an output. So just like when you reverse engineer a computer program, you want to reverse engineer how this neural network works. You want to find the uh, procedures and functions in there, the modules that are doing useful and interesting things. Ideally, you'd be able to just say, hey, this each little module is a neuron, and each neuron does one and only one thing. In reality, it's messy. It's like genes. Like Genes don't just do one thing. Uh, genes often interact with each other in very complex ways, and genes often have redundant data, overlapping data, contradictory data. So the same way, the existence of these neurons is hotly debated. But let's just say the neurons exist and they kind of do one thing, or in some cases they do a bunch of things, but you can still narrow down for a lot of them what it is that they do. So a simple example of a neuron might be a curve detector or an edge detector. A complex one might be a circle detector, which is made out of a bunch of curve detectors rotated. A very complex one might be a cat detector, which is made out of curve detectors, eye detectors, floppy ear detectors, etc. In reality, in a complex enough model, only about a third of these things are detectable to be doing one thing mainly. Most of them are combining many, many things. They're combining for efficiency, and they're combining because of overlapping features. A lot of them are also doing things that are downstream of where you think they're operating. So you think you're looking at something that's, det that's detecting periods at the end of sentences, but really just counting sentences, and it takes you a while to figure that out. If you can figure out what individual neurons are doing, then you can reuse them and you can tune them individually and you can also change them for alignment purposes. You can say, oh, uh, you know, that's the neuron that causes this thing to be, uh, antisocial and to just try and do the opposite of whatever I wanted to do. This is the, di these are the disobedience neurons. This is obviously a fantasy, but you get the point. So how do you figure out what a neuron is doing? Well, for example, with a curve detector neuron, you can feed it a whole bunch of curves and you can see if it detects it as curves. You can make the curves more and more abstract and see if it does a better and better job. You could rotate the curves and see if it looks similar to other neurons that are detecting the rotated version of the curve. You can see if it shows up in multiple different neural networks that all detect curves. You can uh, you see if it's showing up in the otherwise detection of curvy objects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem is it's incredibly painful for a human team to go in there and figure out what a neuron is doing. So as Hasib laid out, what they basically do is they have GPT-4 try to identify neurons in GPT-2, GPT which is a much simpler model, and say, hey, what's your hypothesis of what this neuron is doing? And now let's test it. Let's create those scenarios and see if these neurons indeed fire. And just like through good old fashioned gradient descent, the better off you are predicting, then, you know, the more credence we give to your uh, hypothesis. And they just repeat that over and over until GPT-4 is making up explanations for what individual uh, neurons inside GPT-2 are doing. And you're using GPT-4 to explain GPT-2 because GPT-2 is a much simpler model. The further you go into the layers, the further you get into the stack, the more the neurons are acting in concert together to create neural circuits, the more polysemantic or uh, that's a fancy term for neurons. You have that mean many things or can do many things. The more complicated it gets and the harder it gets to unravel. In other words, you're going from the human equivalent of something as simple as, hey, keep the breathing going, set a biorhythm for breathing to figure out what you want to have for dinner. Much more complex problem to reverse engineer just by looking at the human brain. Anyway, really fascinating stuff. Thanks for sending us down this rabbit hole.